Good afternoon. It's an honor to be with all of you, even if only virtually, for this retreat. And it's a special honor to talk about one of the most important passages in all of Scripture. When the conference started, I imagine you wondered how we could possibly fill seven hours with a discussion of three verses. But that's easy when the verses come from 2 Peter chapter 1. In the span of only a few dozen words, the Apostle Peter, our first pope, gives us an incredible gift. He lays out a roadmap to heaven, a pathway to eternal salvation. It's safe to say that in these verses, we see the steps of sainthood. They aren't just words to listen to, these are truths to live by. In verse 7, we learn that godliness is strengthened by mutual affection. In the New American Bible, godliness is translated as devotion to God. But the question the passage raises for us is this. How can godliness be made stronger by mutual affection? And what is mutual affection? Well, it turns out that mutual affection is essential to holiness. It is often translated as brotherly affection. What Peter is telling us is that when we, as men, join together in common cause, we empower each other to become the men God has called us to be. To borrow another scriptural phrase, we are sharpened as iron sharpens iron. This insight is at the core of the Knights of Columbus. We are a brotherhood of Catholic men helping one another grow in godliness. We are 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, in action. Today I will reflect on how all of us can grow in brotherly affection so that we can be the saints the godly men that we are called to be. I've identified three lessons drawn from the life of our blessed founder, Father Michael McGivney, that are deeply practical for men of all ages. But before I get to those three lessons, I'll start with two simple principles. The first one is this. Brotherly affection is built on love. As disciples of Christ, and as Knights of Columbus, we are more than friends. We are brothers, and brothers love one another. This is the mutual affection Peter is referring to. It's not just a sentiment or a feeling. It amounts to more than simply enjoying one another's company. Rather, for us, mutual affection means we have made a rock-solid commitment to look out for one another, to rely on one another, and to put each other's good before our own. I have been a knight for nearly 40 years, and in that time, I have been continually strengthened and blessed by the commitment and love of my brother knights. I depend on it, and I'm grateful for it. I know that many of you feel the same way. This mutual affection is the source of our fraternal strength. It explains our order's long life. It explains our continued growth over 140 years. And it accounts for the godly impact we have made on our families, our communities, and our countries. The Knights of Columbus is proof that mutual affection strengthens godliness. The second principle is this. Brotherly affection demands heroism. Our Lord is the proof. He gave his life for us, and he asks us to do the same. The times we are living in demand leaders who stand up and step forward when others won't. If we truly have affection for our brothers, then we will sacrifice on their behalf. If we truly see them as brothers, then we will be there for them when the need is greatest. That is the essence of heroism. I've been blessed to know some heroes in my life. As a young man, I served in the U.S. Navy. At one point, I was deployed on the USS Guam. 
My commanding officer was a man named Captain Bill Young. Captain Young is a hero. He was a lieutenant in the Vietnam War where he flew combat rescue helicopters. One night, the news came in that a fellow Navy pilot had been shot down over North Vietnam. Bill was sent out to find him. Let me tell you about the lengths to which his mutual affection for his brother in arms took him. Consider this. For five long hours, Bill flew at treetop level, scouring the area for the missing pilot. The night was so dark that he was forced to turn on his landing lights to illuminate the jungle below. The lights drew intense enemy ground fire straight to him. Again and again, his helicopter was hit. He could have turned back to save his own life, but he didn't. He continued to search hour after hour as bullets flew into the fuselage of his helicopter. Eventually, he found the pilot and extracted him. Then he struggled to fly his nearly crippled helicopter back to the safety of the USS Saratoga. He made it. He saved the downed pilot's life by putting his own on the line. That is brotherly affection. That is what you and I are called to do for each other. For his courage, Captain Bill Young was awarded the Navy Cross, which is the Navy's highest decoration for bravery. Captain Young never talked about his medal. He never said a word about what he did when he was a lieutenant in Vietnam. But we young lieutenants who served under him years later, we knew all about it. And we all hoped that we would have the same kind of courage and love for others when the time came. To this day, I hold up Captain Young as one of the finest heroes I've ever met. Maybe you know a hero or two in your own life. As Catholics, we have plenty of heroes we can look up to. They fought on the battlefield of faith. We call them by the name of saint. Heroism is a saint's job description. In the final stages of canonization, the church declares that someone lived a life of heroic virtue. Put simply, each saint and blessed is a hero. This includes our beloved founder of the Knights of Columbus, Blessed Michael McGivney. The Knights have known that Father McGivney was a hero for well over a hundred years, but the church formally recognized his heroic virtue in 2008 when he was declared venerable. Following his beatification this past October, we now call this hero blessed. And hopefully, in the coming years, we will call him saint. Father McGivney pursued brotherly affection built on a foundation of love. He served his brothers and those under his care in ways that can only be described as heroic. That's why it's right for us to look at his life, which brings me to the three lessons I mentioned earlier. The first lesson is this. How you act is more important than what you say. Or put another way, we can talk a big game about godliness, but we need to live out brotherly affection to make that godliness real. Let's unpack this. We don't actually know much of what Father McGivney said. Only about a dozen of his writings remain and there are only a few first-hand accounts of his homilies. But we do know that Father McGivney rose to the challenge of his time with strong, faithful action, grounded in brotherly affection. He modeled this not only with the men who became his fellow knights, but also in a broader sense of brotherhood that included Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Our founder lived in a time of intense anti-Catholic bigotry. Catholic immigrants were excluded from public office, pushed to the economy's sidelines, and kept on the bottom of the social ladder. In fact, the New York Times referred to St. Mary's Church, where Father McGivney served, as a monstrosity and a blemish on an otherwise upscale street. Despite these insults and bigotry, Father McGivney refused to respond in kind. Instead of playing into the divisiveness, he embraced unity. 
Instead of acting with unkindness, he focused on charity. In fact, he made charity and unity the cornerstone of a new kind of organization, a brotherhood that brought together men to defend each other, their families, and the faith. At every stage, Father McGivney pursued the brotherly affection that brought him and many others closer to God. His actions bear directly on us. It has been said that we live in a new era of anti-Catholicism. There's a lot of truth to that. As in Father McGivney's day, society's elite find it fashionable to demean and undermine the church. In this new fight, the knights are called to step into the breach, but we are not called simply to win an argument. We are called to win hearts through our living example of brotherly affection. With Twitter and Facebook and other social media tools at our disposal, there is no end to the ways we can communicate and say things. There is also no end to the arguing and the pettiness that characterizes so much of the discussion on social media. Talk is cheap, as the saying goes, and in many ways, it's cheaper now than ever before. So how much more of an impact can our actions have? I believe our actions can have an even greater impact than ever before. They prove that we mean what we say and that through brotherhood, we can have the greatest impact on others. One story of our founder's action always stands out. Father McGivney knew a man named Chip Smith who was 21 years old and on death row in a New Haven jail. Smith had been an unemployed bachelor who was struggling with loneliness and alcohol addiction. His every effort to find work ended in disappointment. When he was finally rejected from a job prospect at a local factory, he became depressed and angry. He started drinking heavily and threatened his mother and other workers from the factory with a loaded revolver. Someone called the police and they confronted Smith. In a drunken brawl, Smith killed a police officer. After Smith was taken into custody, he was told that the police officer he had shot would likely die from his wounds. Smith said bitterly, I hope he will die and go to hell. Chip Smith was a man without hope. And yet, for over a year, Father McGivney visited him in prison almost daily and his love for this troubled young man brought about a profound conversion. After several months, those who had known Chip Smith before described him as almost unrecognizable. The guards reported that he would often pray for two and a half hours at a time. The week before his death, he asked for pardon for his faults and the offenses he had committed. He asked Father McGivney to pass a message to the wife of the police officer he had killed. He said, when you see her, tell her I hope God will make up the loss I have caused her. At the end, Smith asked for prayers that he may die a holy death. Father McGivney then accompanied him to the gallows, praying with him until the moment of his execution. That story shows the lengths to which Father McGivney went in service of his brother. These are the same lengths to which all knights are called to go. Service, sacrifice, and action are the Knights of Columbus way. Words are important, but deeds are far more important. So brothers, if we want to grow in godliness, we must put on the affection that leads to action and speaks volumes. The second lesson from Father McGivney is this, and it speaks directly to the topic of growing in mutual affection. Build your band of brothers. Put another way, place a high priority on strong Catholic friendships. Friendship was a central part of Father McGivney's life. Those who knew him well said he had a gift for friendship. We are told that he had an unassuming character, 
yet had the power of drawing men together and directing their actions. Father McGivney knew that strong friendships allow us to strengthen one another in the faith and help us live it every day. This is at the core of the Knights of Columbus. When Father McGivney founded the order, he saw that the Catholic men of his day were looking for friendship in all the wrong places. It often took them to secret societies, many of which were opposed to the faith, where they were promised camaraderie and career advancement. The result was that more and more, Catholic men drifted away from friendships grounded in the faith. As a result, they often fell away from the church entirely. Father McGivney refused to let that stand. He created the Knights so that Catholic men could come together in brotherhood and friendship. What was true in his time is still true in ours. As men, we should take seriously what the book of Proverbs tells us and strengthen one another as iron sharpens iron. At a time when men are drifting away from the faith in high numbers, the Knights are here to build strong friendships around what matters most. In fact, I believe it may be the case that the Knights are needed more now than at any time since our founding. In our day, rather than being drawn into secret societies, men are more likely to be tempted into a sort of isolated comfort. It's the kind of life that can be controlled from your smartphone, no God and no brotherhood needed. To build a band of brothers in these days may require us to look outward beyond ourselves and upward to Jesus Christ. If we are to succeed and to be the heroes we are called to be, we must strive to build deep and lasting friendships upon the solid foundation of our common faith and core beliefs. I've seen the power of these friendships in my own life. They can make us better men, stronger men, more faithful men. They can help us through the hard times. They are the antidote to the anger and isolation that surrounds us. The friendships you form in the Knights of Columbus can help you become a man of Christ and a man for others. So I urge you to be intentional about your friends, for they will shape your future. St. Teresa of Avila once said, what a great favor God does to those he places in the company of good people. Brothers, you can find such people in your life, good men who will help you to become great men. The third and final lesson is this, practice heroic generosity. One example of this has always impressed me. After Father McGivney founded the Knights, and as soon as it was starting to take off, he stepped away from any leadership position. His temptation must have been to keep this group centered on him so that he could enjoy a bit of the limelight. But instead, Father McGivney kept the focus on the men and the families under his care. This was an act of heroic generosity offered in humility. He knew that what the young organization needed most was lay leadership. Through this act of selflessness, he gave the Knights the ability to grow and expand long after he was gone. Father McGivney poured a great deal of himself into the formation of the Knights, but in the end, he did not seek to possess the organization or any power or accolades. This one seemingly small sacrifice has allowed God's grace to work in and through the Knights for the past 140 years. The same must be said of us as husbands and fathers. Our vocation is to be selfless and sacrificial in our care for our wives and children. Our mission is their well-being, and our needs must always come second. The limelight is not for us. Instead, our heroism is to be found in serving our families through hundreds of selfless acts that more than likely will go unseen and unnoticed. These small sacrificial acts 
can allow the Holy Spirit to work and can influence our families in ways we aren't even aware. By modeling this humility and quiet strength, we can instill confidence in our wives and children. This is the kind of heroic generosity that will give them the best chance to flourish in a very difficult culture. And this heroic generosity is best cultivated in brotherhood. By leaning on one another, by sharpening one another, we will find it easier to become the men our families need and the men God expects us to be. There's much more I could say about Father McGivney's life, the lessons it holds, and its connection to the scripture passages we're focusing on today. But for now, I'll just summarize my three points, and they are, first, how you act is more important than what you say. Second, build your band of brothers. And third, practice heroic generosity. These three lessons are especially important for these days of challenge and uncertainty. They are essential for us as men to fulfill our Christian calling. Recently, Pope Francis declared this the year of St. Joseph. It is therefore fitting to end with the consideration of his example as a way of summing up everything I have said. In his recent apostolic letter, Patris Corde, with a father's heart, the Holy Father recalls the times when St. Joseph was faced with extremely difficult and unexpected challenges. Consider the moment when St. Joseph learned that his betrothed, Mary, was bearing a miraculous child, the Messiah. When St. Joseph arrived in Bethlehem and had no safe place to lodge with his laboring wife. And when he was hit with the information that King Herod's men were out to kill his newborn child and that he must flee with Mary and the infant, Jesus, into Egypt. Clearly, he faced very difficult challenges on a constant basis. But these situations, Pope Francis points out, were not chosen by Joseph. They were chosen by God, and Joseph responded by stepping forward with what the Holy Father calls a creative courage. Each of us is called to this kind of creative courage in the challenges of our own lives and our own families. There are no accidents. God has chosen each of us precisely for this moment, and this moment demands our response. We are all being called to a life of heroism, of putting it all on the line for the sake of our brothers and those around us. We must be the leaders who will summon up the creative courage and conviction that this challenging time demands for our families, for our church, and for our country. Father McGivney summoned up that creative courage in the face of pandemic, anti-Catholicism, grinding poverty, and premature death. And in so doing, he changed the world. We have the same high calling. If we say yes to Christ and embrace our vocation, we too can change the world. And if we say yes to brotherly affection, we can even walk the path of sainthood like blessed Michael McGivney before us. May God give us the grace to say yes for the sake of our brothers, for our families, for the greater glory of God, and for the good of his church. Thank you, and may God bless you.